Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Patrick Mishevich, Polish Floridian Business Group. Um, in order to frame the panel and business opportunities in Central and Eastern Europe, I would like to, we will begin with the introduction of 3Cs initiative. Um, something that you may not be familiar with here in South Florida, but something very important for us, um, for Florida, for Latin America, for Europe. Um, we believe the best person to introduce the Three Cs Initiative is Jan Brzezinski. So, round of applause. Uh, <laughs> who grew up in international and polit uh, international political and uh, security issues uh, with his father, uh, late father, is Big uh, Brzezinski, um, the national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and author of numerous books about uh, Eastern Europe. Today, Ian Brzezinski leads the Brzezinski Group, a consulting firm in Washington, D.C., which advises businesses, governments on international security, government relations, and business development. He's been a principal at Booth Allen Hamilton, providing policy and technical support to U.S. forces, as well as military, uh, foreign militaries around the world. Um, during George W. Bush administration, Brzezinski served from 2001 to 2005 as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Europe and NATO policy, involved in Na uh, NATO expansion and NATO operation in the Balkans, Mediterranean, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Um, before that, he worked at the Capitol with the Senate Finance Committee, as well as Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, we are delighted to have you here with us, and I would like you to have join us here and introduce the three Cs. Thank you. Well, Patrick, thank you for organizing this, Amma. Thank you for serving the moderator for the upcoming panel. This is a real uh, opportunity for me because I think you're the first audience or group that I've actually briefed the three C's initiative on that actually in the room, as I've learned by meeting some of you, have actual experience with infrastructure projects. So now I'm a little bit intimidated. Three C's, it's all about completing Europe. By way of background, I spent much of my time working on issues in the past like NATO enlargement, securing the integration of Ukraine, uh, fulfilling the vision of a Europe that's whole, undivided, free, and secure, overcoming the, the legacies of, of Soviet occupation, the political legacies, economic legacies, the infrastructural legacies. And while we've made a lot of progress, that process is still underway. Ukraine is not part of, 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 of the transatlantic community. It's not part of the EU yet. There are countries in the Balkans uh, that still aren't in the EU or in, in, in NATO. And I learned that also there's a great disparity between the economic, I mean, between the structural bedrock of Western Europe and the infrastructural bedrock of, of Central Europe. And in other words, Central Europe, if you stood on a satellite and looked down on Europe and you looked over to Western Europe, you would see a spider web of roads and highways and canals, gas lines, um, uh, pipelines, oil lines, electric grids. And then if you looked over to Central Europe, you would see something very different. It's, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's relatively barren. Uh, it's only a few true m multinational cross-border arteries, and there are a couple of east-west highways and a couple of east-west pipelines, and not much. And as a result, Central Europe remains a somewhat disaggregated community of nations that aren't really fully integrated in the way, in terms of infrastructure and economically, as you find in Western Europe. So the three C's initiative, and of course it refers to the three C's, the region between the Baltic Sea, the Adriatic, and Black Sea. And it's an initiative involving 12 European member states of, European Union member states of Central Europe, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria. Well, Austria is interesting, it's in, not really part of Central Europe in my view, but they've been brought into this. Slovenia, Croatia, Romania, and Bulgaria. And this initiative is all about accelerating the infrastructural development of the Three Seas region, developing those north-south arteries. For example, if you drove from Paris to Marseille, 
it would take you about eight hours. If you drove from Warsaw to Constantia, it would take you 22, 23 hours. Now granted, the, the, going from Warsaw to Constantia is almost twice as long, but not quite twice as long as the Paris and Marseille route. Still, that, that shows the inefficiency of, of transport networks in, in the region. So three C's is all about accelerating the development of digital transport and energy infrastructure in the region on a north-south basis, but also on an east-west basis. It's meant to overcome the infrastructural legacy of Soviet occupation. The Soviets, in their year decades of occupation, never did much to develop infrastructure. We can debate why. Maybe it was their way of controlling of the Central European states. Maybe they didn't care. But the reality is that infrastructure is there and it's an impediment to economic growth. And people estimate that there are about $500 billion in infrastructure, in infrastructure projects that need to be uh, done in the region. And the, what are the benefits and some of the drivers of the Three Seas Initiative? Well, one, it's to further the convergence of this region into wider Europe, because you have greater connectivity on a north-south basis and increased connectivity on an east-west basis it will naturally tie into the networks, the spider web of networks in Western Europe, and that helps complete uh, Europe economic convergence in, in Europe. It's meant to leverage the power of infrastructure. And I was talking uh, to the lady from uh, the, the Florida Chamber of Commerce, how infrastructure, roads and highways and canals and such, can be a driver of economic integration, economic growth, economic competitiveness, uh, even economic resilience. So, for example, if you have more uh, ports or LNG terminals on these coasts and you have pipelines that zip across the region, you can help pull away this region from its dependence on Russian gas. We're seeing a bit of that already now with U.S. LNG imports coming into, uh, in, 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 into Poland and feeding into the still undeveloped network of the region. Key element of the three C's initiative, it doesn't want to be an effort just to basically go to the Western European governments or the international financial institutes and say, give us more money to build these things. The attitude is, is that that's been happening for the last three decades. And indeed, the EU has made a lot of investment into highways and other arteries in the region, but it's not happening fast enough. What they want to do is have a mechanism where they can catalyze and capture, attract, and draw in the trillion dollars of capital that's sloshing around in global markets and draw, drive them in to the region to provide the capital that can accelerate the, the building of these projects. And there's reason to believe that can be done if you had a proper catalyst. So re, three C's have about 110 million people, an aggregate GDP of $1.7 trillion, and a growth rate of 2.4 to 3% out to 2030. So if you build a well thought through project over here, it will be used and could even be tollable or taxable and a source of revenue. And from a geopolitical perspective, as I mentioned, it furthers the vision of a Europe whole and free. And from an American perspective, a central Europe that is more prosperous, it's more capable of standing on its own, it's economically more re resilient, automatically contributes to a more prosperous, stable, economically resilient Europe and a better a Europe that's a better partner and more capable partner of the United States in dealing with the challenges around the world. Let me just move this up a little. One thing I like to say is uh, this Three Seas Initiative is in many ways as important as NATO membership and EU membership. NATO membership provided the security necessary for prosperity and freedom. EU membership broke down the trade barriers and provided the regulatory harmony that can facilitate economic growth. But the Three Seas Initiative and its trade and its, its um, energy, transport, and digital networks are the hard wire of integration. They're the hard wire of completing Europe. So this is a quick history of 3SI. I should add, why is there a certain urgency to this project? First, 
Central Europe has reemerged as a zone of great power competition. And this is recognized in Washington, D.C. It's increasingly recognized in West European capitals. The Russians, for a long time, have been using energy pressure, trade embargoes, political subversion, military threats, invasion even in, 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 in the region, to try and pull away the Central Europeans from the West. China is now an active investor in Central Europe. Uh, in fact, there's talk about then trying to put $17 billion into a Helsinki Tallinn tunnel. And we're in the age of increased economic volatility, so you want to be more economically resilient. And then, of course, Europe is in a state of dold economic doldrums, slow growth they can't bust out of, and infrastructure can be a driver of growth. This is a quick summary of the Three Seas Initiative. The Three Seas Initiative actually dates back to 2005, when there was a project to build a north-south pipeline from the Baltic Sea to the Adriatic. And it died in 2008 because of the financial crisis. But I was approached by one of my clients, Grupo Lotos, said, how do we reanimate that idea? I teamed them up with uh, former National Security Advisor General Jim Jones, who was National Security Advisor to President Obama. He's an avid energy expert. And we had them chair a task force that produced this report in 2014. It's a terrible title, Completing Europe from a North-South Corridor to Energy, Transportation, and Telecommunication Union. And in short, it was picked up by the president of Croatia. Uh, much to our surprise, she was excited about it. She hold, held a mini summit in, on the side of the UN meetings in September of 2015. She got the polls fired up about it at a Dubrovnik summit she held in, in 2016, when all of a sudden the, uh, the community of nations agreed to call it the Three Seas Initiative. There was a major breakthrough summit uh, in Warsaw in 2017, when President Trump went to Warsaw. That was a Three Seas summit. And President Trump came in there, and with using American power, he blasted wind and momentum into the, uh, into the sails of three seas, and it started moving forward. Then we had a summit in Bucharest. We started getting a little bit more operational. I'll, I'll talk about that. And the last one was in Ljubljana. And what I want to get your interest in, in, in is the next summit, which will be coming up in Tallinn, uh, probably in June of uh, this next year, 2020. Where's the U.S. on three seas? During the Obama administration, they, 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 they supported it in principle, but didn't really engage at the cabinet level, the secretary of state level, the secretary of energy level, the national security advisor level. They focused primarily on specific projects in the three C's uh, area. And it was good, it was supportive, but not as forward-leaning as the Trump administration. So I, as I mentioned at the Warsaw summit, President Trump robustly endorsed it. And in fact, he has a, a fingerprint on it. Because as a businessman, he said, this can't be serious. It's not going to get any uh, private sector capital unless you have a real business dimension to it. So he said there has to be a three C's business forum. And at every uh, business, at every three C's summit since then, we've had a business forum trying to bring over uh, you know, Central European, West European, and North American business leaders. The main, we've had Secretary Perry attend uh, the summits. And the main interagency lead is actually Ambassador Georgette Moschbacher in Poland, who has been a force on this issue. I'll give you a second to read this, but I think it's one of the more, one of the best statements that President Trump has made on transatlantic security. And it's from his Warsaw speech, and it captures the legacy of uh, the Central Europe inherited from Soviet occupation. It talked about the power of infrastructure to transform and build and drive growth in, in a region. Um, it talks about how Europe can become stronger through, through this initiative, not just Central Europe, but Europe. I was kind of shocked because this was one of the most pro-European speeches I've seen the, the president give. Now, I'll just quickly run through these summits because it's, it's just kind of interesting how it's evolved. So this is the 3C summit in Dubrovnik. And what's important to note, uh, here's the president of Croatia, extremely dynamic uh, president, used to be ambassador to the United States. She convinced President Duna this initiative to, to, to get into the game. And we had the Warsaw summit. And so now the initiative includes not only uh, Duda, but also President Trump. And then we had the Bucharest summit 
And this is really important because now it's not only the United States that's showing up, but also the President of the European Commission and the Foreign Minister of Germany. So you can see that now the, the great powers are beginning to take this more seriously. Bucharest was a, a big breakthrough because all the previous uh, summits had been really talk about the geopolitics of, of the three seas. I, I won't bore you with all this, but the bottom line is, is one, at Bucharest you had senior top level German participation. The president of Germany was over there. That's really important. That brings a lot of weight in uh, European financial um, circles, as does President Juncker. Uh, they came up with a list of 48 priority projects. You, know, you may ask, does that mean every project is a three C's project? Uh, it's, it's a lot, but it's not all of them. I can assure you of that. But it's also pretty amazing that you could get 12 democracies to narrow down a set of priorities of 15 in energy, 10 in digital, and 24 in transport. And then they started launching a three C's investment fund. At, at Bucharest, they signed a letter of intent. Uh, and it's the next summit when that actually matured. So here we are in Ljubljana last, last June. And you can see Secretary Perry, U.S. Secretary of Energy, Juncker again, sustained EU commitment. And the really big outcome of, of this is it's at this summit they launched the Three Cs Fund. And I want to talk a little bit about that. This is where the fund gets real and is making its most tangible effort to catalyze private sector capital. It's a Polish idea. The Poles said there ought to be a fund that actually serves to catalyze the capital sector's interest and in investment in Central Europe. So let's say, they said, let's create a three C's fund, and they offered to put 500 million euros down. And the Romanians came up and said, we'll put in 100 million euros. The Estonians and Latvians are about to put in money into this fund. The idea is that this fund will invest in an appropriate way probably in the realm of risk reduction for infrastructure projects, uh, but in a way to kind of demonstrate that this is a region worth investing in. And how is it going to do that? Because this fund is going to operate on purely commercial terms. Kaczynski, Duda, whoever, cannot come in and say, we put in 500 million euros, so invest in Baltic pipe, the pipeline from Denmark to, to Poland, gas pipeline. The fund manager will look at it and go, thank you, Mr. President. We'll look at this. And he may go, this is a good idea. Or he may go, no. We don't see sufficient rate of return. Or we see no rate of return. Or not timely enough rate of return. They will operate independently. And this fund has been stood up in, in, in Luxembourg. Uh, they've identified two fund managers. The Amber Group, uh, which is based in London, but interestingly owned by the Hunt family of Texas. Part of the Hunt, uh, now part of the Hunt Commercial Group, uh, and they will handle the trans, the, the uh, digital and the transport dimensions. And Credit Suisse is the other fund manager, which will handle the e energy side. They're hoping to build up this fund through national contributions, that is from the three C's, and IFI contributions, international financial institutions like the European Investment Bank. Uh, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development and others up to $3.5 billion. I've got to admit they're struggling a little bit because right now there are only two who have put in money, two are talking about it, and the others, quite frankly, in my view, are free riding on this. But it's, it's important. I'd be interested in, in your reactions, how real, you, how real an impact you think this could have. So what's going to happen in Tallinn? So I am totally fired up about Estonians raising their hands and saying, we want to host this. This is a great face for the initiative. They have you know, a rule of law uh, kind of image. They're digital ninjas. They're very, very professional. And I have to say, more than any other government, they've moved out faster and earlier uh, in terms of organizing this. After they announced uh, that they would do this, which was a surprise to everybody, it left me stunned because they were largely uninterested you know, just showing up to the meetings. Uh, by the end of June, early July, they already had an interagency tax force. The government side and the president side is working together, which is sometimes unusual. They're hosting a bunch of sh what they call Sherpa meetings, where presidential advisors and other relevant officials come in 
and meet together and strategize how to, how to move things forward on three Cs. Some of the big issues uh, will, one, uh, well, see, most probably most important, is getting the three Cs fully stood up and making its initial investments. They hope to have the three Cs in investment fund locked down uh, and doors open by the end of this month. And they want to make initial investments, small investments, in infrastructure projects in, in Europe by the end of this first quarter, no later than second quarter of, of, of next year. That, to me, is going to be the real uh, indication of how serious this initiative is getting. Some of the more geopolitical initiatives that will define this year is how will they be able to sustain U.S. government support? I think so. German support? I think so. EU? We'll see because there's a new European Union, European Commission. Um, I think they need to start thinking about how 3Cs relates to countries in the Western Balkans who aren't part of, uh, of, of the EU and Eastern Europe, particularly Ukraine. And then there's a real serious effort by the Estonians to set up a 3SI secretariat. That is the go-to point for all the information you'd want to know about three projects in the 3Cs regions. This is what's done in other parts of the world where there are real significant cross-border regional um, infrastructure initiatives like Africa and, and Southeast Asia. And I think the target that they're, they are shooting for, which hasn't been met in the previous 3C summits, is they want to have robust participation from North American and European business and finance leaders. Most of the people who have shown up to the business forum have largely been Central European. They need to have more outside capital, so to speak, uh, to show up and get engaged in order for this thing to actually take off. And last but not least, I'll just make one pitch for small idea that I'm pushing. So I think the United States should actually invest into the Three C's Fund or create a parallel organization like a Three C's Enterprise Fund. Uh, let me be very clear. I don't think that should happen until we have all the others participating. So there is a, in a chicken and egg scenario. There is a first step, and the first step is that we've got to get the Slovenes, the Bulgarians, the, the Latvians, the Lithuanians to contribute. Because why should we put money in so that others can freeload off of that? But if they do that, if we put a billion dollars in, in, into that fund or set up a parallel structure, that would be only one sixtieth of the pool of resources we have for our own um, uh, financial development corporation, our own development uh, pool of, of, of resources. And to have the United States put that kind of money in there would be a powerful signal of reassurance to the private sector, and I think would help stimulate interest on this side of the Atlantic and Western Europe. It could also be complemented by the Germans, because I know there's talk in Germany about doing something like that. It hasn't re reached critical mass, but the chatter is, is, is picking up. And I mentioned enterprise funds. I don't know how many are familiar with enterprise funds. But in, in 1990, 1989, the Seed Act of 1989, we created enterprise funds. And one of the most prominent ones is the one in Poland. And in Poland, we put in like 200 million, 250 million. And when we shut it down, it brought back uh, double that almost. So it was a net return for us. And what that fund did is that was $250 million that was put under the control of private sector managers who then invested in promising um, Polish companies, and it actually generated a huge amount of private sector capital. All of the uh, enterprise funds we had in Central Europe, totaled, so there was a Baltic uh, enterprise fund, the Romanian enterprise fund, the Hungarian enterprise fund, the uh, newly independent states enterprise funds, and some of them actually failed. They were actually bottom up. When we shut them down, they generated $1.7 billion. So we made a 500 to $600 million return on that in 19 basically 1990, 2000 monies. So if we could do that, uh, and it's a long shot, you would be promoting region and some of America uh, growth in, in a region that features some of our most important allies. We'd be countering the Russians and the Chinese. And something that I think would resonate with Trump and his team is we'd actually have a real prospect of positive return on that over, over a decade. So that's the three C's, where it is and, and where it's going. Thank you.